Who's the nastiest dinosaur of them all? He was named the Tyrant Lizard King in 1904, and generations ever since have had little cause to argue about the biggest, scariest meat-eater ever, Tyrannosaurus Rex. He's the real-life monster from Central Casting, the bloodthirsty villain of scores of movies. T-Rex has become a toy merchant's dream product line, and lately, even an auctioneer's multi-million dollar prize. Tyrannosaurus Rex, known as Sue. $7,600,000. So what's the source of T-Rex's enduring charm? Seven tons of carnivorous fury, a head the size of a meat locker on a body bigger than a school bus, dagger teeth as long as railroad spikes, capable of ripping off 500 pounds of flesh in a single bite. But two new dinosaurs have been unearthed, which may be even larger and just as deadly. They were cousins who lived half a world away from T-Rex and long before it. They pose the most serious challenge ever to the throne of the Tyrant Lizard King. Kids sense what many adults have long forgotten. That dinosaurs are both monsters of the past and mysteries of the present. Frightening, yet safe. Far back in the past, but still very much alive in their minds. I'd like to buy this. All right, that'll be 950. Even though they've been shrunk, stuffed, and sold by the millions, Dinosaurs hold an enduring source of wonder for the child in all of us. Thanks, have a good day. Thanks. And the bigger and more terrifying the dinosaur, the better. Loving dinosaurs is not the same as knowing them. But once in a while, a young admirer will grow up to be a professional dinosaur hunter. Phil Curry is one who did. He's a paleontologist at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Alberta, Canada, and the world's leading expert on meat-eating dinosaurs. When I was a child, I opened up a cereal box one day and there was a plastic dinosaur inside. And uh, the next thing you know, I was getting my parents to buy cereal like crazy until I could uh, acquire most of the set. Unfortunately, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex was the one I really wanted because one of my friends had it and it was the neat one. But today, T-Rex's reign as king of the meat eaters is in jeopardy, something Curry knows better than anyone. For almost a century now, the most famous dinosaur has unquestionably been Tyrannosaurus rex. The reason for that is that Tyrannosaurus rex was the largest flesh-eating animal to ever walk the earth, and it conjures up an image of absolute terror. Nevertheless, in the last few years, two new animals have been found in the southern hemisphere, and they threatened to dethrone the king. One of T-Rex's challengers lived in the lush environment of South America nearly 100 million years ago. The other behemoth dominated the river deltas of northern Africa. And until recently, both titans were shrouded in mystery. This is the big jawbone of the uh, skull that we found in place. Paul Sereno is a paleontologist uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, not only do you see a row of teeth, but you see one just beginning, a fresh tooth, just beginning to emerge here from the socket. In 1995, uh, he plotted an expedition to search for one of T-Rex's challengers in the Sahara Desert. Sereno's expedition would trace the path of European scientists who had discovered a giant dinosaur in North Africa in the early 1900s. Uh, it's a very huge desert, and on this edge, some 40 years ago, uh, French explorers and, and paleontologists, often single-handedly and sometimes by camel, had come across teeth 
of an animal they called and dubbed Carcharodontosaurus. They named the animal for its razor-sharp teeth and because it resembled a much-feared predator of modern-day man. As the name implies, a Carcharodon means uh, shark, and that's also the, the genus name of the, of the great white shark living today. The function of the teeth in general is very clear. They're for slicing. They're vertical blades that would have just come down like a pair of scissors. Uh, they would have started a small hole here, and it would just cut right along when the dinosaur closed its jaws, would have snapped right through bone and flesh. The explorers boxed up the bones and took them to Germany to be displayed in a museum. But World War II intervened. And in the firestorms of the Great Air War, bombs destroyed the remarkable fossils. The only specimen of the giant and the only possible threat to T. rex's reign was buried by rubble. Following the scientists' old maps, Sereno would carry on their expedition in the rugged mountains of Morocco. His team headed across the desert, searching the sands, but coming up empty-handed. What made it especially tough going, in fact it was physically the toughest expedition I've ever run, was the fact that you were exploring and looking for fossils on the face of a cliff. And your job was to scale that cliff uh, day in and day out in 100 to 120 degree heat uh, uh, and, and basically looking for patches of rock that were exposed that might house the bones of, of animals that uh, we yet really didn't know much about. Under the blazing sun, Sereno lost nearly a pound a day. Weeks had passed and the team had still found nothing. They were in their last days of prospecting on high cliffs when Sereno finally found a piece of skull. And I turned it over and I saw this hollowing and I knew that uh, right away and also by the sort of the structure of the brain case that we were dealing with a predatory dinosaur. And the question was, uh, was this uh, the tail end of a skull that had weathered out millions of years ago or was this the tip of a skull, the rest of which was in the cliff? Spread out over the cliff face, the team hunted feverishly for matching pieces. We were in the last week of the expedition. Uh, it, was, it, it, it could be a thrilling uh, a finale to our expedition. I found nothing. I came back and I, I puzzled over this bone, almost breathless. I went back up the cliff face and that's when I saw, uh, perched on a, a little pedestal of rock, uh, the, uh, a cut face of bone that matched the piece that I was holding in my hand. It was about 20 feet up. And I scaled back up there and I could fit this piece right on and I knew that the skull was going into the cliff. So can you look at this, have you guys seen the teeth? This is incredible. You know, well preserved there. What we eventually did was uh, go into the side of the cliff. We had to remove tons of rock over this uh, because the, the skull kept on going in until we could surround the skull and take it down off the cliff. Put the inside. Then this is the right cheek bone with all the teeth in it. And we can see one, two, three, there's a replacing tooth here, four, five, six, seven, eight. As difficult as it was to excavate the skull, it was a bigger problem finding the rest of the animal, which was scattered by an ancient river. Uh, what we had was a big river that was transporting lots of uh, bone matter downstream. Most of the time we'd find teeth or small pieces of, of bone broken up and rolled sometimes for as many as 50 miles. We unearthed uh, the animal realizing that it was a big animal but we didn't really know how large. The team was fortunate enough to recover crucial parts of the jaw including the cheekbone called the jugal, which would help them estimate the total size of the skull. Back in Chicago, when the team measured the jaw and its components, they discovered that the skull was 15% bigger than the specimens destroyed during World War II. 
back in the laboratory, we began to open up the jackets, and, and by the time we had uh, the, the, the big jaw exposed, uh, we had uh, jaws of other predatory dinosaurs in the laboratory, and it, it just, uh, it was so monstrous compared to these other jaws that we began to realize just, in fact, how big this animal was. I remember calculating one day, uh, once we got uh, the jaw piece and the jugal, and realizing that the skull was, uh, was over five feet long, uh, this was an enormous animal. On the other side of the globe, in Patagonia, Argentina, another dinosaur find would startle the world. This barren ground is rich hunting for dinosaur fossils. The wind constantly blows across these plains, exposing layers of rock 100 million years old. It was here in 1993 that an amateur dinosaur hunter, Ruben Carolini, stumbled across a huge bone. He called Rodolfo Correa, a South American paleontologist with a passion for dinosaurs. For me, dinosaurs is the most important thing in the world. I'm working with dinosaurs. I wanted to do since I was a kid. As Correa and his team headed across the Badlands, he often thought about what life was like millions of years ago. As I was driving into the field, I can't imagine all this giant walking around and shaking the earth. Compared to Paul Sereno's excavation high up in the cliffs of Africa, Korea's was less demanding and more rewarding. Not only were the bones lying near the surface, but they formed an astonishingly large percentage of the dinosaur's skeleton. First time I came here was in uh, August of 1993. In that time, we spent four weeks working in this site, and we recovered about 70% of the animal. Now we are looking for some missing part of the skeleton because we didn't find yet uh, any part of the arms of the animal or the feet of the animals. In just over a month, the crew dug up almost the complete dinosaur. Among the still missing bones is the jugal, which is just as important to Korea as it had been to Paul Sereno. Also like Sereno's find, Korea's dinosaur was discovered in an ancient riverbed, which created problems in finding pieces of the skull. We saw that the uh, currents of the stream affected more the head part of the body than to the tail. The, uh, the whole uh, skull was discovered completely disarticulated, and the uh, pieces, every pieces, every piece of the skull was found um, uh, separate from the others. To raise money needed for the reconstruction of the dinosaur, Korea teamed up with an American science writer and dinosaur popularizer, Don Lessam. You want to try? Find me a jugal, please, Don. Lessam would help bring the discovery to the world's attention. Now, if I knew what I was doing, and I had phenomenal luck, I would find the jugal bone. That's what I'm most hoping to find here. And Rodolfo, too, I think. It's the one missing bone from the skull that would tell us even more definitively about the shape of the entire skull. The death of all dinosaurs is a source of endless mystery and speculation. And despite Korea's discovery of a nearly intact skeleton, he will never know why this animal chose this very spot to lay down and die. What we do know is that it wouldn't see the light of day for another 100 million years. After the bones were excavated, Korea trucked them to his laboratory, where technicians spent months cleaning them. Korea called in Maria Gravino, a local art teacher, to carefully sculpt missing parts. She based her work on Korea's educated guesses and on bones the team had already excavated. Then, temporary casts were taken and transported to a nearby museum where they were laid out alongside the real bones on a dirt floor to form the first look at the full dinosaur. 
Compared to the head of the dinosaur, the back end was preserved nearly intact. You call them hemo arches, I call them the chevrons, these little pieces that stick down from the tail. To me, it's unusual to find so many of them in such good preservation. Uh, we were very lucky that the uh, tail was found practically in articulation and uh, the sequence of the vertebrae was very uh, well preserved. And beside every vertebrae, we found the different, all of the uh, chevrons that we get. We're just dealing with a lightweight cast here, but how much would this have weighed in real life? Oh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, real bone, of, uh, the fossil bone, uh, it could be about 80, 90 kilos in weight. 200 pounds mm -hmm. for one bone. Right. I'm glad the shape of the leg bone was Korea's first clue that he was dealing with a new and unfamiliar animal, one worthy of its own name. Uh, it's very funny. Uh, the moment that you have to decide the name of the, of the dinosaur because you have a huge responsibility on your shoulders. You know that if you are uh, right in proposing a new genus, that name will be preserved in the future forever. Choosing a name for the dinosaur is, is like bringing a new baby to the world, a big baby. <laughs> Giganotosaurus means giant reptile from the south. This is a, not the real head, I realize. No, it is not. And also, it's not the uh, real, the actual idea that we got about the size of the skull of Giganotosaurus. This, this, this guess is showing our first guess about the size, the length of the skull of Giganotosaurus. So you guessed too small. Right, yes. An accurate cast of the head would be crucial to solving the mystery of just how big Giganotosaurus was. After much meticulous searching, Rudolfo Correa and his crew finally found the prize. More than 70% of the Giganotosaurus' skull, including the entire brain case. So we found, right here, we found the brain case. Looking to the uh, bottom, to the wall, to assemble a replica of Giganotosaurus, Korea called in Mary Odano, who has been reconstructing dinosaurs for more than three decades. But in the right position. The right position because the hemo arches were still with them. Mm -hmm. She compares this present day dig to the earliest days of dinosaur hunting in the American West. It's like the 1880s. My thoughts are finding this vast amount of material, new material, and all over this continent that has never been known before. To help Korea get a more accurate measurement of Giganotosaurus, O'Donnell created molds of the bones and brought them back to her lab in Los Angeles. There, with the help of a team of workers, she began to cast the whole dinosaur. Painstaking work that would bring Giganotosaurus to life in three dimensions. Several months into the project, Maria Gravino arrived from Argentina to help link her sculpted bones with O'Donnell's cast. Most people think that you find a complete a dinosaur all laid out, and all you have to do is, is clean it off, put it together, and put it on display. That just never happens. And there are always missing parts, parts that need reconstruction. So I learned to um, model and to make molds on missing parts. Only a handful of people in the world specialize in casting dinosaurs. Mary O'Donnell's been at it for over 30 years. In 1966, when the LA County found a T-Rex skull, that was the largest skull in existence at that time. And I got to work on that, and I thought, that is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> It'll never happen again. After months of difficult work, the final cast of the head is ready to be made. Polyester resin, thickened with talc and white paint, is brushed on the solid areas of the rubber mold. This material, just painted by itself, is not very strong. It'll be backed with glass cloth, strips of glass cloth, and then it becomes very strong. Once the glass cloth is applied, the resin begins to dry, a process which can take an entire day. And while the resin dries, 
Odano and the crew work quickly to clamp and bolt the many sections of the beast's head together. Rudolfo Correa has come from Argentina to check in on the process and help pull the mold. We're all feeling pretty apprehensive about uh, this first cast. It's the first reconstruction for this skull. It's the largest of its kind. It's an entirely new animal. <laughs> We're hoping very much that uh, the, the cast will come out good and be um, a success. Finally, after a half a year, the time has come to pull the mold and see if their effort has paid off. This is a huge mold with a lot of underhangs, a lot of um, nooks and crannies that are going to be difficult to separate the mold from the cast. Yeah, get your fingers in here. The fingers in here and it'll pull. And when I say pull it, it means we'll be pulling on that. It'll be under a great deal of stress to remove the silicone rubber from the cast. Oh, God. It's, oh, beautiful. Just beautiful. When the upper jaw was finally revealed, it was perfect. It's really beautiful. Wow. Really beautiful. <coughs> you sweat a little blood over that. <laughs> oh. Ooh, with holes in his head and everything. I'll tell you, this is better than I expected. It really is. <laughs> All that worry. <laughs> God. For Mary O'Donnell, Reconstructing Giganotosaurus was the culmination of a life's dream. It's terrific. <laughs> it's like an out-of-body experience, but it's a reality. That, oh, you're seeing something that no human eyes have seen before. And that lived, in this case, a hundred million years ago. Oh, I don't know. And it's a rare privilege that those of us who work in this field have. Back in Chicago, Paul Sereno and his team were busy putting together the bones from Morocco, a puzzle made more difficult to solve because so many pieces were missing. Through patience, uh, the graduate students and myself over a couple of months, uh, slowly, like a porcelain plate dropping on the floor, we, we put that porcelain plate back together, and that, and that was the whole midsection of the skull. Well, this is really fantastic. Although they'd found only half a skull, an artist could flesh out a replica of the full head of Cacarodontosaurus. And Sereno could make some impressive estimates of its overall size. I think we're talking about a skull that is, is, is clearly uh, five and a half feet long, and we're talking about a body length of between 45 and 50 feet. But the complete cast of the Giganotosaurus head, measured in at just over six feet long, half a foot longer than the largest T-Rex. The race to dethrone the king of dinosaurs continued. Korea and his team brought the Giganotosaurus head to New York to be viewed at a conference at the American Museum of Natural History. Even New Yorkers who thought they'd seen everything were surprised at the sight. And at the conference, the group of paleontologists and artists was equally impressed. Wow, marvelous. Blood and guts, the whole business. I'm amazed. It's absolutely monstrous. Big teeth. And we find teeth in Utah that size but not a complete skull. Well, I've always liked big meat eaters. I grew up in this museum in New York. I grew up with this T-Rex in New York, the first T-Rex ever mounted. I'm very fond of it. I just looked at the skull for the first time and I'm overwhelmed to see it in person. It's uh, one of the most amazing skulls I've seen 
I saw the T-Rex uh, skull, which I grew up with looking at T-Rexes, but to see this creature, uh, which is much bigger, it's astonishing. Yeah, the kid in me really is interested in which one's the biggest. And I think we all want to know what was the biggest meat eater among the dinosaurs. The challenge had been made. Giganotosaurus and Cacarodontosaurus. Two ferocious giant meat eaters, both large, perhaps larger than T. rex. But could either one of the new monsters truly lay claim to T. rex's title as king of the meat eating dinosaurs? And which one would it be? As word spread of the discovery of two giant dinosaurs which might dethrone T. rex, paleontologists wanted to know how they evolved and how closely they were related. Both Cacarodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus walked the Earth about 100 million years ago. Their bodies were similar in shape, but one lived in Africa, the other in South America. How did two such similar animals evolve so far apart? 145 million years ago, when the landmass was one supercontinent, the largest predator was a 30 to 40 foot long meat eater called Allosaurus. If you want to catch an Allosaurus today, the place to go is central Utah. The Cleveland Lloyd Quarry near Price has produced a phenomenal jumble of allosaur bones in the last two decades, enough to remake 44 dinosaurs. And this makes the, uh, the blood pressure of a dinosaur hunter rise. His heart starts to beat f fast. Th this is a paradise for a uh, dinosaur hunter. The paleontologist in charge of the site is Don Burge. And the concentration of the bones right here uh, would go up to, say, 50 bones per square yard. I think maybe it was a, some kind of a lake or spring-fed bog, and it had to have something to, to entice these meat-eaters, a, a bait for the trap, maybe like uh, cheese for a mouse. In this case, a plant-eating dinosaur that was stuck out here in a bog. And so this bipedal carnivore looks out there, ah, here's supper, and he gets stuck in this bog. But what was the relationship, if any, between the Allosaurus and the two new giants of the South? All I can say is they're certainly related. They're cousins. Paleontologist Bob Bacher believes that a more mysterious Jurassic cousin, Megalosaurus, may have been the largest of all the meat eaters. Bacher runs the Tate Museum in Casper, Wyoming. Allosaurus only had one animal to fear that was a rare predator even bigger than they were. That predator was a megalosaur, an animal that's still much of a mystery. We just call it Big Ed. A complete skeleton of megalosaurus has never been found, but Bacher has a few impressive parts, including the jugal, which he uncovered in the mountains of Wyoming. This is part of the megalosaur. It doesn't look like much. It's a rib shaft that fit in the rear of the torso around the guts. But what's spe spectacular is the rib keeps on going and going and going and going and going and going. This rib is uh, four and a half feet long, which means the guts, if you added the, uh, the belly, are six feet deep. And if you added the top of the backbone, you have eight and a half feet of torso. That's huge. That's as big as any Giganoto or Carcarodonto or any T-Rex. So this mystery Jurassic dinosaur, Big Ed, is right up there with the largest. Bigger doesn't necessarily mean tougher. See these holes? Yeah. Those are wounds. This thing got bit. If they both lived at the same time, who would win a fight between Megalosaurus and T-Rex? Megalosaurs were close quarter fighters. They were designed to attack in densely bushed, densely forested wet terrain. Their flexible bodies would let them go around trees. 
their incredible Popeye arms would let them grab a prey close in and slash. T-Rex is totally different. It needs open habitat. It's got speed. It's got height. It's got a powerful bite, but it needs room to maneuver. So in an open terrain, T-Rex would beat the Megalosaur. But in a barroom brawl in a Jurassic forest, the Megalosaur could beat T-Rex. As Barker sees it, Megalosaurus is one of the first giant meat eaters from which Allosaurus evolved, followed by, on separate continents, Giganotosaurus and Cacarodonosaurus. The Megalosaurus are their own distinct family, but they're very close to the root, the trunk of the family tree of every single giant meat eater and little meat eater that came afterwards. They're the patriarchs of these predators. But T. rex evolved on a separate evolutionary branch. I have no doubt at all that uh, Cacarodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus are in the same family. Tyrannosaurus is not only in a different family, but those families are certainly more remotely related to each other. If we look at uh, Giganotosaurus and Cacarodontosaurus, they're like brother and sister. Uh, compare that to Tyrannosaurus and it's more like a third or fourth cousin. The older Jurassic giants, Allosaurus and Megalosaurus, were lords of a slowly dividing world. Dinosaur evolution comes in two acts. The first act, all the world was one stage. If you were a giant meat eater, a Jurassic meat eater, a Megalosaur, an Allosaur, you could walk and spread your genes from one continent to another. Every place had the same fauna. By the middle of the next dinosaur period, the Cretaceous, the Earth was taking on a more modern shape, splitting into two continents, north and south. The continents are pulling apart. You can no longer walk easily from Wyoming to South America or Europe to Africa. And that's where Giganotosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus come in. They are Gondwana, they're southern continent specialists. They ruled the seashore, the lake shore, the floodplains, in these southern continents. And in North America, there's very little that's like them. But Giganotosaurus and Cacardontosaurus were very similar animals. Stocky, narrow-jawed, and sharp-toothed. Too similar for either to have evolved in isolation. This similarity suggests that Africa and South America may have been linked by land bridges long into the Cretaceous, longer than anyone had previously thought. Both Giganotosaurus and Cacarodontosaurus had evolved with the same weaponry, a mouthful of slashing teeth. These teeth are sharp, are very, very flat and very sharp. So they work just like knives, just like we use knife for when we are eating a steak. So um, at the same time, they are, they, these teeth are very weak. They are not strong. They are not as strong like Tyrannosaurus rex teeth. What we're seeing in Giganotosaurus is a mechanism for the animal to come in, basically take a big gouge out of the side of the prey by slicing with its teeth into the side of the flesh, avoiding the bone, and then moving back as fast as it can so that it avoids getting hit or turned on uh, by the animal that it's going after and then basically waiting to see the effects and then coming in again and again until its prey weakens and falls. 35 million years later, T. rex was a very different animal. Just as big, perhaps, but with a narrower frame, smaller front limbs and more robust jaws. With this different body came new weapons, teeth of a very different design. T-Rex teeth, unlike any other meat eater's teeth, are huge, swollen, armor-piercing spikes. Not blades, they're not knives. These are armor-piercing bullets for cracking and crushing. All of the other giant meat eaters, all of them, have teeth that are much sharper in the front and back, much thinner side to side. Good for slicing, but if they hit a bone, they just break, they snap. It was T-Rex's massive head and jaw muscles which made it a powerful predator. Obviously, most of the work uh, that these animals achieved was with their, with their jaws. They were uh, running uh, skulls, essentially, and they attacked with their, with their jaws, and they ripped with their jaws, and they had very strong necks. 
uh, the arms were sort of a, a supplemental thing. Skull that I found the Running side. skulls, big yeah. and ferocious, but it makes one wonder just how smart these animals the were. The hill, and these pieces fit together. To find out, Paul Sereno looked inside the skull of Cacardonosaurus. And if you open up the, the skull, you'll see the cavity inside where the brain would be located. They took the skull to the medical center at the University of Chicago. Now to get an exact shape of that cavity, we strapped this back together again. Hans took the brain case, the bone, and sent it through a CAT scan machine. The CAT scan would give them a three-dimensional cross-section of the brain case and information regarding the actual size of the brain. One thing we can see in the CT data is that when, when you slice the, the brain case, you can actually see the inside space for where the brain was occupying. And when, when you look at, at that and sort of measure it, you can see that, that the brain on this guy was actually really small, like, like very reptile-like. And then you can compare it to other, other carnivorous dinosaurs. And what we did is make in plastic uh, with the CAT scan information, a model of that space, a very exact model, uh, so we can know the shape and ultimately the volume of the space which housed, housed the brain. But because the cavity was also filled with fluid, the brain took up much that, less than the total space. The size of the brain of Carcharodontosaurus is about half the volume of what you see here, uh, less than the volume of your fist. And it would have weighed in at half a pound. In order to make comparisons with other species, Larson developed software from the CAT scan data that would give him a 3D image of the brain of Cacarodontosaurus. He then discovered evidence of an evolutionary tie between Cacarodontosaurus and one of its ancestors. One interesting thing about Cacarodontosaurus is that if you compare it to an Allosaurus, the, the brain shapes, the brain sizes are virtually identical. And even though you have an animal like a Carodontosaurus, which is twice the size of an Allosaurus, the brains didn't really change much in terms of scaling. He compared its brain with a similar image of T. rexes. In the cerebral cortex, where intelligence is centered, T. rex had evolved more and had a sizable advantage. This area here is where the cerebral hemispheres would have been located. And when you, when you uh, approximate the, the volumes of each of these two animals, you can, you can show that the Cerebral hemispheres in Tyrannosaurus are approximately 50% larger than those of Cacarodontosaurus. A pretty amazing difference. T. rex's brain was also larger than the brain of Giganotosaurus. If brain size, not body size, were the determining factor, T. rex would remain the king. Overall, right now it appears that uh, Giganotosaurus did not have a brain that was anywhere near as large as the brain of Tyrannosaurus rex, and consequently we would think that it's a less intelligent animal. But relative to its huge size, T. rex wasn't a very smart animal. Its brain was smaller than the brain of an ostrich, for example, one of the dumbest birds. What really matters is that all of the meat eaters were brainy by dinosaur standards. The bottom line is that you just have to be smarter than the prey you're going after. And again, this is, uh, I think, uh, a little bit more evidence for suggesting that these were active predatory dinosaurs, that they were chasing other animals, because they do have brains that are larger than any of the prey that were around at the same times of them. T. rex also had another advantage over Giganotosaurus and Cacarodontosaurus, its eyesight. At the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota, fossil dealer Neil Larson has studied the eyesight of some of the largest T. rexes. The eyes of a Tyrannosaurus rex were probably the largest of any land pred predator that ever lived. The only animal, uh, there are other animals that have larger eyes, such as the giant squid, Archituthus, and whales have, some whales have larger eyes. But as far as eyesight, this animal had incredibly keen eyesight. When it viewed its prey, a wide-skulled T. rex, with its eyes further apart, may have had better depth perception, helping it judge distances more accurately. In contrast, Carcharodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus, with their narrower skulls and smaller brains, may have had a harder time figuring out just how far they were from a potential kill. 
Whatever the differences in their eyesight, all these predators focused on one thing, meat. But were they all deadly predators? Giganotosaurus and Cacarodontosaurus, two huge meat-eating dinosaurs from the south. But does big also mean slow? One clue would be whether the meat-eaters were warm-blooded, allowing them longer periods of activity. To find the answer, researchers in this laboratory at North Carolina State University studied samples of bone taken from various parts of the body of Giganotosaurus. The reason that we were so interested in Giganotosaurus is that it, the preservation of this animal is absolutely astounding. One of the things that we need in fossil animals is we need a pretty complete skeleton. You can't do this type of analysis on just bone fragments or bits of bone. Using a revolutionary technique, William Showers and Rhys Barrick measure the oxygen molecules still present in the dinosaur's bones millions of years after its death. Okay. The measurements revealed an even distribution of heat between the outer extremities of the animal and the core of its body. According to their research, Giganotosaurus was warm-blooded. For the trunk part of the body, uh, where we have our ribs and vertebra and all of our you know, body organs, that there was not very much temperature variability. So the body core of this animal uh, was very constant, so it had a very constant body temperature, and that's typical of warm-blooded animals. There wasn't large temperature differences like you'd see in a cold-blooded animal. A Komodo dragon, for example, which is a cold-blooded animal, has large temperature differences between its tail and its core body. And that means Giganotosaurus was like every other meat-eating dinosaur they studied, including T. rex. Warm-blooded, like modern birds and mammals. That means that it had, could be much more active, it grew fairly rapidly, and it was going to need uh, a lot of food. In essence, relative to modern animals, if we want to make a comparison, uh, Giganotosaurus very likely had to eat on a daily basis the same amount that perhaps a whole pride, maybe two prides of lions would have to eat. In addition, the discovery suggests something about Giganotosaurus's longevity. It's hard to tell, but it's very likely that these guys lived in the same order of magnitude as modern elephants do. So they could live, you know, maybe 20 to 50 years or something like that, uh, as opposed to living 120 years if they happen to be, you know, with a reptilian metabolic rate. Although the full lifespan of a Giganotosaurus could have been as long as 50 years, it may often have been cut short by its violent lifestyle. With all these meat eaters that I have seen, we have now excavated five Tyrannosaurus rexes, and every one of them shows healed injuries, broken bones, many broken bones, claw marks, tooth marks. It shows that these animals commonly fought among each other, perhaps for food, perhaps for uh, mating, perhaps over their babies, perhaps over just being Friday night. To the men who discovered them, Carcharodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus were vicious hunters. I think that this animal was a predator. I think that, um, uh, I think that based on, on just the uh, the, uh, uh, the shearing action of the teeth, I, I, I feel that this animal was made to grab something actively and cut off an entire limb and just swallow it uh, whole. I, I don't see it as a, as a passive scavenger. We are not working with a heavy and, um, and slow scavenger, but uh, it was a real hunter. I think that Giganotosaurus was an active predator uh, I think that Giganotosaurus was unable to, bro to break bones and to eat from dead carcasses. But Jack Horner, one of the world's leading paleontologists, disagrees. Horner contends that the giant meat-eaters, including T. rex, were more often scavengers. T. rex's arms, first of all, they're, they're the same length as mine. T. rex you know, is 40 feet long and weighed 12,000 pounds and has arms the same length as mine. But when you flesh them out, 
we find that this much of the arm actually is encased in muscle, and so only this much sticks out, and and really can't even put his hands together, and so he, so he can't really use them to grab a hold of anything. Whatever T. Rex was, it was a bone crushing animal, and bone crushing is usually not something that 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 is attributed to a to a predator. A predator can just kill its prey, eat what it wants to, and leave. It's the scavengers that come in and crush the bones and take everything that is left. Other paleontologists see a middle ground. The giant carnivores were both predators and scavengers. Any top predator must do both, must be ready to do both and do it well. The spotted hyena is a famous scavenger today in Africa, but it actively hunts. Lions are famous hunters, but they routinely steal carcasses from hyenas. Any giant meat-eating dinosaur will kill. Any giant meat-eating dinosaur, if it were alive today, would also take dead bodies. The challengers to the throne never met T-Rex. But if they did, who would come out on top? So kids, are we ready? Are we ready for the year of the dinosaur? All right, here we go. Finally, the public had a chance to see Giganotosaurus go head to head with T-Rex for the first time. Everyone, we're gonna count down from five. Five, four, three, two, one, are we ready? Mary O'Donnell's full-scale cast of Giganotosaurus was erected inside the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And the public flocked to the museum to get the first look at the new giant. I like it. And to decide for themselves who's the king. T-Rex. I have to say T-Rex. He's scarier and stronger. Um, they both win. An enormous skeleton of T-Rex was looking on menacingly just a few feet away. It's really interesting that there's something, there's an animal, you know, dinosaur bigger than T-Rex, which is really big. Phil Curry traveled across the continent to see Giganotosaurus restored for the first time. He was eager to know its true size. So far it's uh, pretty close to Tyrannosaurus rex in uh, total body measure. The uh, neck vertebrae are a little bit longer, um, but the vertebrae through the main part of the abdomen seem to be about the same length. Three foot eight. After taking measurements, Curry compared them to his data of other T Rexes he's examined around the world. He concluded that Giganotosaurus is just over 40 feet in length, slightly longer than the largest T Rex. Overall, then, it appears that Giganotosaurus definitely has a longer skull, and you would expect that because of the way the musculature is orientated at the back of the head. It's got a longer femur, but the tibia and the metatarsus are shorter, and the overall length is about the same. In terms of weight, uh, when we look at the circumference of the femur, it's a good way to estimate the actual weight of the animal. And there's no doubt at all that in that measurement, Giganotosaurus seems to come in as a much heavier animal than T-Rex and may outweigh it by as much as 30%. And how does Giganotosaurus compare to Cacarodontosaurus? If we look at Giganotosaurus, uh, it's about the size of this one we have behind us. Uh, when we get more, we need to get more specimens to be able to say what the range of body size was. I think we can clearly say they overlapped. And uh, their maximum body size uh, may have been very similar. So in the final analysis, has T-Rex been dethroned as king of the dinosaurs? If you ask me, and people have, they do continuously, which of the five or six or seven giant meat eaters is the ultimate king? I'd still have to say 
Professor Osborne was right in 1904 when he named this animal Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrant lizard king. Because when push comes to shove, this animal bites much harder, penetrates more deeply than any other dinosaur. So has Tyrannosaurus rex been dethroned? I don't think so. I think the Tyrannosaurus rex is still one of the largest, maybe not the largest, but certainly one of the largest. And in terms of its speed, in terms of its ability to process meat, and in terms of its intelligence, this dinosaur is still by far the most sophisticated. So as long as we keep looking at more primitive forms like Cacaridonosaurus and Giganotosaurus, I think that Tyrannosaurus rex still doesn't have to worry. We now know there were dinosaurs larger than T. rex. Perhaps one day, even larger killers will emerge. It's likely, in fact, with a new kind of dinosaur discovered, on average, every six weeks. But until the next rival is discovered, there are already enough ancient giants, newfound and familiar, to keep us in awe of the terrifying animals which once ruled the Earth.